The Knife Thrower by Stephen Milhauser. When we learned that Hench, the knife thrower, was stopping at our town for a single performance at 8 o'clock on Saturday night, we hesitated, wondering what we felt. Hench, the knife thrower. Did we feel like clapping our hands for joy? Like leaping to our feet and bursting into smiles of anticipation? Or did we, after all, want to tighten our lips and look away in stern disapproval? That was Hench for you. For if Hench was an acknowledged master of his art, that difficult and faintly unsavory art about which we knew very little, it was also true that he bore with him certain disturbing rumors, which we reproached ourselves for having failed to heed sufficiently when they appeared from time to time in the arts section of the Sunday paper. Hench, the knife thrower. Well, of course we knew his name. Everyone knew his name, as one knows the name of a famous chess player or magician. What we couldn't be sure of was what he actually did. Dimly, we recalled that the skill of his throwing had brought him early attention, but that it wasn't until he had changed the rules entirely that he was taken up in a serious way. He had stepped boldly, some said recklessly, over the line never before crossed by knife throwers, and had managed to make a reputation out of a disreputable thing. Some of us seem to recall reading that in his early carnival days he had wounded an assistant badly. After a six-month retirement, he had returned with his new act. It was here that he had introduced into the chaste discipline of knife-throwing the idea of the artful wound, the mark of blood that was the mark of the master. We had even heard that among his followers there were many, young women especially, who longed to be wounded by the master and to bear his scar proudly. If rumors of this kind were disturbing to us, if they prevented us from celebrating Hench's arrival with innocent delight, we nevertheless acknowledged that without such dubious enticements we'd have been unlikely to attend the performance at all, since the art of knife-throwing, for all its apparent danger, is really a tame art, an outmoded art, little more than a quaint, old-fashioned amusement in these times of ours. The only knife throwers any of us had ever seen were in the circus sideshow or the carnival ten in one, along with the fat lady and the human skeleton. It must, we imagined, have galled Hench to feel himself a freak among freaks. He must have needed a way out. For wasn't he an artist in his fashion? And so we admired his daring, even as we deplored his method and despised him as a vulgar showman. We questioned the rumors, tried to recall what we knew of him, interrogated ourselves relentlessly. Some of us dreamed of him, a monkey of a man in checked pants and a red hat, a stern officer in glistening boots. The promotional mailings showed only a knife held by a gloved hand. Is it surprising we didn't know what to feel? At eight o'clock precisely, Hench walked onto the stage, a brisk, unsmiling man in black tails. His entrance surprised us. For although most of us had been seated since half-past seven, others were still arriving, moving down the aisles, pushing past half-turned knees and squeaking seats. In fact, we were so accustomed to delays for latecomers that an 8 o'clock performance was understood to mean one that began at 8.10 or even 8.15. As Hench strode across the stage, a busy no-nonsense man, black-haired and top-bald, we didn't know whether we admired him for his supreme indifference to our noises of settling in, or disliked him for his refusal to countenance the slightest delay. He walked quickly across the stage to a waist-high table on which rested a mahogany box. He wore no gloves. At the opposite corner of the stage, in the rear, a black wooden partition bisected the stage walls. 
Hench stepped behind his box and opened it to reveal a glitter of knives. At this moment, a woman in a loose-flowing white gown stepped in front of the dark partition. Her pale hair was pulled tightly back, and she carried a silver bowl. While the latecomers among us whispered their way past knees and coats and slipped guiltily into their seats, the woman faced us and reached into her bowl. From it, she removed a white hoop about the size of a dinner plate. She held it up and turned it from side to side, as if for our inspection, while Hench lifted from his box half a dozen knives. Then he stepped to the side of the table. He held the six knives fan-wise in his left hand, with the blades pointing up. The knives were about a foot long, the blades shaped like elongated diamonds, and as he stood there at the side of the stage, a man with no expression on his face, a man with nothing to do, Hench had the vacant and slightly bored look of an overgrown boy holding in one hand an awkward present, waiting patiently for someone to open a door. With a gentle motion, the woman in the white gown tossed the hoop lightly in the air in front of the black wooden partition. Suddenly a knife sank deep into the soft wood, catching the hoop, which hung swinging on the handle. Before we could decide whether or not to applaud, the woman tossed another white hoop. Hench lifted and threw in a single swift, smooth motion, and the second hoop hung swinging from the second knife. After the third hoop rose in the air and hung suddenly on the knife handle, the woman reached into her bowl and held up for our inspection a smaller hoop, the size of a saucer. Hench raised a knife and caught the flying hoop cleanly against the wood. She next tossed two small hoops, one after the other, which Hench caught in two swift motions, the first at the top of its trajectory, the second near the middle of the partition. We watched Hench as he picked up three more knives and spread them fanwise in his left hand. He stood staring at his assistant with fierce attention, his back straight, his thick hand resting by his side. When she tossed three small hoops, one after the other, we saw his body tighten. We waited for the thunk, thunk, thunk of knives and wood, but he stood immobile, sternly gazing. The hoops struck the floor, bounced slightly, and began rolling like big dropped coins across the stage. Hadn't he liked the throw? We felt like looking away, like pretending we hadn't noticed. Nimbly, the assistant gathered the rolling hoops, then assumed her position by the back wall. She seemed to take a deep breath before she tossed again. This time, Hench flung his three knives with extraordinary speed, and suddenly we saw all three hoops swinging on the partition, the last mere inches from the floor. She motioned grandly toward Hench, who did not bow. We burst into vigorous applause. Again, the woman in the white gown reached into her bowl, and this time she held up something between her thumb and forefinger that even those of us in the first rows could not immediately make out. She stepped forward, and many of us recognized, between her fingers, an orange and black butterfly. She returned to the partition and looked at Hench, who had already chosen his knife. With a gentle tossing gesture, she released the butterfly. We burst into applause as the knife drove the butterfly against the wood, where those in the front row could see the wings helplessly beating. That was something we hadn't seen before, or even imagined we might see. Something worth remembering. And as we applauded, we tried to recall the knife throwers of our childhood. The smell of sawdust and cotton candy. The glittering woman on the turning wheel. Now the woman in white removed the knives from the black partition and carried them across the stage to Hench, who examined each one closely and wiped it with a cloth before returning it to his box. Abruptly, Hench strode to the center of the stage and turned to face us. His assistant pushed the table with its box of knives to his side. She left the stage and returned pushing a second table, which she placed at his other side. She stepped away into half-darkness 
while the light shone directly on Hench and his tables. We saw him place his left hand, palm up, on the empty tabletop. With his right hand, he removed a knife from the box on the first table. Suddenly, without looking, he tossed the knife straight up into the air. We saw it rise to its rest and come hurtling down. Someone cried out as it struck his palm, but Hench raised his hand from the table and held it up for us to see, turning it first one way and then the other. The knife had struck between the fingers. Hench lowered his hand over the knife so that the blade stuck up between his second and third fingers. He tossed three more knives into the air, one after the other. Rat-tat-tat, they struck the table. From the shadows, the woman in white stepped forward and tipped the table toward us, so that we could see the four knives sticking between his fingers. Oh, we admired Hench. We were taken with the man's fine daring. And yet, as we pounded out our applause, we felt a little restless, a little dissatisfied, as if some unspoken promise had failed to be kept. For hadn't we been a trifle ashamed of ourselves for attending the performance? Hadn't we deplored in advance his unsavory antics, his questionable crossing of the line? As if in answer to our secret impatience, Hench strode decisively to his corner of the stage. Quickly the pale-haired assistant followed, pushing the table after him. She next shifted the second table to the back of the stage and returned to the black partition. She stood with her back against it, gazing across the stage at Hench, her loose white gown hanging from thin shoulder straps that had slipped down to her upper arms. At that moment we felt in our arms and along our backs a first faint flutter of anxious excitement. For there they stood before us, the dark master and the pale maiden, like figures in a dream from which we were trying to awake. Hench chose a knife and raised it beside his head with deliberation. We realized that he had worked very quickly before. With a swift, sharp drop of his forearm, as if he were chopping a piece of wood, he released the knife. At first we thought he had struck her upper arm, but we saw that the blade had sunk into the wood and lay touching her skin. The second knife struck beside her other upper arm. She began to wriggle both shoulders, as if to free herself from the tickling knives, and only as her loose gown came rippling down did we realize that the knives had cut the shoulder straps. Hench had us now. He had us. Long-legged and smiling, she stepped from the fallen gown and stood before the black partition in a spangled silver leotard. We thought of tightrope walkers, bareback riders, hot circus tents on blue summer days. The pale yellow hair, the spangled cloth, the pale skin touched here and there with shadow. All this gave her the remote, enclosed look of a work of art while at the same time it lent her a kind of cool voluptuousness, for the metallic glitter of her costume seemed to draw attention to the bareness of her skin, disturbingly unhidden, dangerously white and cool and soft. Quickly the glittering assistant stepped to the second table at the back of the stage and removed something from the drawer. She returned to the center of the wooden partition and placed on her head a red apple. The apple was so red and shiny that it looked as if it had been painted with nail polish. We looked at Hench, who stared at her and held himself very still. In a single motion, Hench lifted and threw. She stepped out from under the red apple, stuck in the wood. From the table, she removed a second apple and clenched the stem with her teeth. At the black partition, she bent slowly backward until the bright red apple was above her upturned lips. We could see the column of her trachea pressing against the skin of her throat and the knobs of her hips pushing up against the silver spangles. Hench took careful aim and flung the knife through the heart of the apple. Next from the table, she removed a pair of long white gloves, which she pulled on slowly, turning her wrists tugging. She held up each tight-gloved hand in turn and wriggled the fingers. 
At the partition, she stood with her arms out and her fingers spread. Hench looked at her, then raised a knife and threw. It struck into her fingertip, the middle fingertip of her right hand, pinning her to the black wall. The woman stared straight ahead. Hench picked up a clutch of knives and held them fanwise in his left hand. Swiftly, he flung nine knives, one after the other, and as they struck her fingertips, one after the other, bottom to top, right, left, right, left, we stirred uncomfortably in our seats. In the sudden silence, she stood there with her arms outspread and her fingers full of knives, her silver spangles flashing, her white gloves whiter than her pale arms, looking as if at any moment her head would drop forward, looking for all the world like a martyr on a cross. Then slowly, gently, she pulled each hand from its glove, leaving the gloves hanging on the wall. Now Hench gave a sharp wave of his fingers, as if to dismiss everything that had gone before, and to our surprise the woman stepped forward to the edge of the stage and addressed us for the first time. I must ask you, she said gently, to be very quiet, because this next act is very dangerous. The master will mark me. Please do not make a sound. We thank you. She returned to the black partition and simply stood there, her shoulders back, her arms down but pressed against the wood. She gazed steadily at Hench, who seemed to be studying her. Some of us said later that at this moment she gave the impression of a child who was about to be struck in the face though others felt she looked calm, quite calm. Hench chose a knife from his box, held it for a moment, then raised his arm and threw. The knife struck beside her neck. He had missed. Had he missed? And we felt a sharp tug of disappointment, which changed at once to shame, deep shame. For we hadn't come out for blood, only for, well, something else. And as we asked ourselves what we had come for, we were surprised to see her reach up with one hand and pull out the knife. Then we saw, on her neck, the thin red trickle, which ran down to her shoulder. And we understood that her whiteness had been arranged for this moment. Long and loud we applauded as she bowed and held aloft the glittering knife, assuring us, in that way, that she was wounded but well, or well wounded, and we didn't know whether we were applauding her wellness or her wound, or the touch of the master, who had crossed the line, who had carried us, safely, it appeared, into the realm of forbidden things. Even as we applauded, she turned and left the stage, returning a few moments later in a long black dress with long sleeves and a high collar, which concealed her wound. We imagined the white bandage under the black collar. We imagined other bandages, other wounds on her hips, her waist, the edges of her breasts. Black against black, they stood there, she and he, bound now, it seemed, in a dark pact, as if she were his twin sister, or as if both were on the same side in a game we were all playing, a game we no longer understood. And indeed she looked older in her black dress, sterner, a school marm or maiden aunt. We were not surprised when she stepped forward to address us again. If any of you in the audience wish to be marked by the master, to receive the mark of the master, now is the time. Is there anyone? We all looked around. A single hand rose hesitantly and was instantly lowered. Another hand went up. Then there were other hands, young bodies straining forward, eager. And from the stage, the woman in black descended and walked slowly along an aisle, looking closely, considering, until she stopped and pointed. You. And we knew her, Susan Parker, a high school girl who might have been our daughter, sitting there with her face turned questioningly toward the woman, 
her eyebrows slightly raised as she pointed to herself. Then the faint flush of realization, and as she climbed the steps of the stage, we watched her closely, wondering what the dark woman had seen in her, to make her be the one, wondering too what she was thinking, Susan Parker, as she followed the dark woman to the wooden partition. She was wearing loose jeans and a tight black, short-sleeved sweater. Her reddish-brown and faintly shiny hair was cut short. Was it for her white skin she had been chosen? Or some air of self-possession? We wanted to cry out, Sit down! You don't have to do this! But we remained silent, respectful. Hench stood at his table, watching without expression. It occurred to us that we trusted him at this moment. We clung to him. He was all we had, for if we weren't absolutely sure of him, then who were we? What on earth were we who had allowed things to come to such a pass? The woman in black led Susan Parker to the wooden partition and arranged her there, back to the wood, shoulders straight. We saw her run her hand gently, as if tenderly, over the girl's short hair, which lifted and fell back in place. Then, taking Susan Parker's right hand in hers, she stepped to the girl's right, so that the entire arm was extended against the black partition. She stood holding Susan Parker's raised hand, gazing at the girl's face, comforting her, it seemed. And we observed that Susan Parker's arm looked very white between the black sweater and the black dress, against the black wood of the partition. As the women gazed at each other, Hench lifted a knife and threw. We heard the muffled bang of the blade, heard Susan Parker's sharp little gasp, saw her other hand clench into a fist. Quickly, the dark woman stepped in front of her and pulled out the knife. And turning to us, she lifted Susan Parker's arm and displayed for us a streak of red on the pale forearm. Then she reached into a pocket of her black dress and removed a small tin box. From the box came a ball of cotton, a patch of gauze, and a roll of white surgical tape, with which she swiftly bound the wound. There, dear, we heard her say, you were very brave. We watched Susan Parker walk with lowered eyes across the stage, holding her bandaged arm a little away from her body. And as we began to clap, because she was still there, because she had come through, we saw her raise her eyes and give a quick, shy smile, before lowering her lashes and descending the steps. Now arms rose, seats creaked, there was a great rustling and whispering among us for others were eager to be chosen, to be marked by the master, and once again the woman in black stepped forward to speak. Thank you, dear. You were very brave, and now you will bear the mark of the master. You will treasure it all your days. But it is a light mark, do you know, a very light mark. The master can mark more deeply, far more deeply. But for that you must show yourself worthy, Some of you may already be worthy, but I will ask you now to lower your hands, please, for I have with me someone who is ready to be marked. And please, all of you, I ask for your silence. From the right of the stage stepped forth a young man who might have been fifteen or sixteen. He was dressed in black pants and a black shirt and wore rimless glasses that caught the light. He carried himself with ease, and we saw that he had a kind of lanky and slightly awkward beauty, the beauty, we thought, of a water bird, a heron. The woman led him to the wooden partition and indicated that he should stand with his back against it. She walked to the table at the rear of the stage and removed an object, which she carried back to the partition. Raising the boy's left arm, so that it was extended straight out against the wall at the level of his shoulder, she lifted the object to his wrist and began fastening it into the wood. It appeared to be a clamp, which held his arm in place at the wrist. 
She then arranged his hand, palm facing us, fingers together. Stepping away, she looked at him thoughtfully. Then she stepped over to his free side, took his other hand, and held it gently. The stage lights went dark, then a reddish spotlight shone on Hench at his box of knives. A second light, white as moonlight, shone on the boy and his extended arm. The other side of the boy remained in darkness. Even as the performance seemed to taunt us with the promise of danger, of a disturbing turn that should not be permitted or even imagined, we reminded ourselves that the master had so far done nothing but scratch a bit of skin, that his act was after all public and well-traveled, that the boy appeared calm. And though we disapproved of the exaggerated effect of the lighting, the crude melodrama of it all, we secretly admired the skill with which the performance played on our fears. What it was we feared exactly, we didn't know, couldn't say. But there was the knife thrower bathed in blood light. There was the pale victim manacled to a wall. In the shadows, the dark woman. And in the glare of the lighting, in the silence, in the very rhythm of the evening, the promise of entering a dark dream. And Hench took up a knife and threw. Some heard the sharp gasp of the boy, others a thin cry. In the whiteness of the light, we saw the knife handle at the center of his bloody palm. Some said that at the moment the knife struck, the boy's shocked face shone with an intense, almost painful joy. The white light suddenly illuminated the woman in black, who raised his free arm high as if in triumph. Then she quickly set to work, pulling out the blade, wrapping the palm in strips of gauze, wiping the boy's drained and sweating face with a cloth, and leading him off the stage with an arm firmly around his waist. No one made a sound. We looked at Hench, who was gazing after his assistant. When she came back alone, she stepped forward to address us, while the stage lights returned to normal. You are a brave boy, Thomas. You will not soon forget this day. And now I must say that we have time for only one more event this evening. Many of you here, I know, would like to receive the palm mark, as Thomas did. But I am asking something different now. Is there anyone in this audience tonight who would like to make... And here she paused, not hesitantly, but as if in emphasis... The ultimate sacrifice? This is the final mark, the mark that can be received only once. Please think it over carefully before raising your hand. We wanted her to say more, to explain clearly what it was she meant by those riddling words, which came to us as though whispered in our ears in the dark, words that seemed to mock us even as they eluded us. And we looked about tensely, almost eagerly, as if by the sheer effort of our looking we were asserting our vigilance. We saw no hands, and maybe it was true that at the very center of our relief there was a touch of disappointment. But it was relief nonetheless, and if the entire performance had seemed to be leading toward some overwhelming moment that was no longer to take place, still we had been entertained by our knife-thrower, had we not. We had been carried a long way, so that even as we questioned his cruel art, we were ready to offer our applause. If there are no hands, she said, looking at us sharply, as if to see what it was we were secretly thinking, while we, as if to avoid her gaze, looked rapidly all about. Oh, yes. We saw it too, the partly raised hand which perhaps had always been there, unseen in the half-darkened seats, and we saw the stranger rise and begin to make her way slowly past drawn-in knees and pulled-back coats and half-risen forms. We watched her climb the steps of the stage, 
a tall, mournful-looking girl in jeans and a dark blouse, with lank, long hair and slouched shoulders. And what is your name? the woman in black said gently, and we could not hear the answer. Well then, Laura, and so you are prepared to receive the final mark? Then you must be very brave. And turning to us, she said, I must ask you, please, to remain absolutely silent. She led the girl to the black wooden partition and arranged her there, unconfined, chin up, hands hanging awkwardly at her sides. The dark woman stepped back and appeared to assess her arrangement, after which she crossed to the back of the stage. At this point, some of us had confused thoughts of calling out, of demanding an explanation, but we didn't know what it was we might be protesting. And in any case, the thought of distracting Hench's throw, or perhaps causing an injury, was repellent to us for we saw that already he had selected a knife. It was a new kind of knife, or so we thought, a longer and thinner knife. And it seemed to us that things were happening too quickly up there on the stage, for where was the spotlight, where was the drama of a sudden darkening? But Hench, even as we wondered, did what he always did. He threw his knife. Some of us heard the girl cry out, Others were struck by her silence. But what stayed with all of us was the absence of the sound of the knife striking wood. Instead, there was a softer sound, a more disturbing sound, a sound almost like silence. And some said the girl looked down as if in surprise. Others claimed to see in her face, in the expression of her eyes, a look of rapture. As she fell to the floor, the dark woman stepped forward and swept her arm toward the knife thrower, who for the first time turned to acknowledge us. And now he bowed, a deep, slow, graceful bow, the bow of a master, down to his knees. Slowly the dark red curtain began to fall. Overhead the lights came on. As we left the theater, we agreed that it had been a skillful performance, though we couldn't help feeling that the knife thrower had gone too far. He had justified his reputation, of that there could be no question. Without ever trying to ingratiate himself with us, he had continually seized our deepest attention. But for all that, we couldn't help feeling that he ought to have found some other way. Of course, the final act had probably been a setup. The girl had probably leaped, smiling to her feet as soon as the curtain closed, though some of us recalled unpleasant rumors of one kind or another. Run-ins with the police, charges and counter-charges, a murky business. In any case, we reminded ourselves that she hadn't been coerced in any way. None of them had been coerced in any way. And it was certainly true that a man in Hench's position had every right to improve his art, to dream up new acts with which to pique curiosity. Indeed, such advances were absolutely necessary, for without them a knife thrower could never hope to keep himself in the public eye. Like the rest of us, he had to earn his living, which admittedly wasn't easy in times like these. But when all was said and done, when the pros and cons were weighed, and every issue carefully considered, we couldn't help feeling that the knife thrower had really gone too far. After all, if such performances were encouraged, if they were even tolerated, what might we expect in the future? Would any of us be safe? The more we thought about it, the more uneasy we became. And in the nights that followed, when we woke from troubling dreams, we remembered the traveling knife thrower with agitation and dismay.